All right, I want to begin this morning with a little quiz. And this is just to see if you guys have been paying attention the last weeks and even months. So um, if you want, pull out your phones. There's going to be a number on the screen that you can text your answers to. Um, if you don't have a phone, you can just remember we'll go with the honor system on this one. But three different questions. So get ready. Here's the first one. When Paul entered a new city or town, what did he look for? When he entered a new city or town, what did he look for? A, a bar. B, an Airbnb. C, a bath. Or D, a synagogue. When he entered a town, what did he look for? Number two, Paul reasoned with the people from the Hebrew Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. How did people typically respond? A, with joy. B, with jealousy. C, with wonder what the Hebrew Scriptures are. Or D, A and B. So how did people typically respond? And then finally, three. Why did Paul and his companions move on from city to city? A, their work was done. B, they ran out of money. C, they were running for their lives. Or D, their Uber driver was double parked. All right. Why did they move from city to city? Everybody got your answers to the questions? Did you text them to that number by chance? All right, so here we go. Number one, when Paul entered a new city or town, what did he look for? D, a synagogue. Good job. Two, Paul reasoned with the people from the Hebrew Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. How did people typically respond? D, A and B, with joy and with jealousy. And then finally, C, why did Paul and his companions move on from city to city? And the answer is C, they were running for their lives. All right, how many people got them all right? Okay, well, you guys can collect your prizes uh, in heaven. <laughs> for the rest of you guys, well... You've got some time to prepare before you get to heaven in hopes of getting a prize, all right? So um, hopefully that is, is at least engaging, and it's a little bit of a recap of what we've been seeing over the, the months that we've been walking with Paul through this book that we call Acts, and it's really the establishment of the early church. This morning we're going to continue in Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 17, looking at verses 10 through 15 together, and it's page 1097 if you want to follow along in your church Bibles. Here's what I hope we will see. If you want to know the truth about God, and specifically Jesus Christ, all you have to do is look. If you really want to know the truth, all you have to do is look. So look with me now, beginning in verse 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So here's what we see. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, who happens to be writing all of this down, were running for their lives yet again. And they were fleeing from Thessalonica. And they came to this, this city, this town that was really off the beaten path. And um, I'll demonstrate where that is with this handy map. So again, <clears throat> we've been traveling this way. And then Paul crossed over here into, this is Greece. And Philippi was the first city, and then he made his way down here, and he came to Thessalonica, and we talked about that last week, and now he's in Berea, not too far from the coast. So that's where he is. 
And we see that he's following this same pattern. Every time he goes to a city or a town, where's the first place that he looks? A synagogue. And so he finds a synagogue, and then he goes, and he begins to reason with the folks there. So it would be primarily Jews, but there are also some God-fearing Greeks who are seeking the truth about God. And he would open up the scriptures with them. And then he would share with them about the life of Jesus and how he fulfilled all that the laws and the prophets spoke about. And so he'd be reasoning from what we call the Old Testament primarily out of the first five books of the Bible, and then also the prophets. Now, here's what we're going to see this morning, is is there was a different response from the Bereans, different than the ones that they experienced in Thessalonica and, and elsewhere as well on the first missionary journey. And we're going to see four things, that these people were open-minded. They were open-minded. Secondly, they're eager for the truth about God eager for the truth about God. Thirdly, they are committed to examining the facts. They're committed to examining the facts. And finally, what we see is their beliefs lead to action. Their beliefs lead to action. So, the primary verse that we're going to look at this morning is verse 11. Look again with me. Now, the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So the first thing that we see is that they are open-minded. Notice here it says that the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Now I looked at a number of different translations and not everybody uses the the term noble character. If you look at some translations, it simply says noble. Other places, it it said um, noble-minded, and yet in other translations, it was open-minded. And so, what does it mean to be noble? What does it mean to be noble? To be noble is to be open-minded, fair, thoughtful, and well-intentioned. That's what it means to be noble. And so, when it's saying that they were noble-minded, I don't think the focus was really on their DNA or or their lineage. I I think what he's talking about here is really their character. They were open-minded. They were seeking the truth about God. And so Paul began to reason with them. Now, one of the things that we see is that um, these people were pretty receptive to the message. They were also receptive to the messenger. But that has not been the pattern to date with Paul, because everywhere he seems to go, there's hostility. People are against the message, and they're against him, the messenger. A lot of these people seem to have already made up their minds. They made up their minds about God, and they're closed off to the message of Jesus Christ and the hope that he offers. See, it doesn't matter how much truth or how much proof they're presented with. They've made up their minds. Do you know anybody like that? That they have these preconceived or misconceived ideas about Jesus or about Christianity or what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and they've just shut off. And it doesn't matter how much proof or how much truth you bring to them, they have made up their minds. You know, a lot of times, people like that, I I think, are, are fearful just like we talked about last week and and some of these jealous Jewish leaders, they felt threatened by Jesus because he he threatened really their belief system. He he threatened their lifestyle. He threatened their livelihood and he ultimately threatened their autonomy. And, And they knew, they knew deep down that if they were to truly believe and become followers of Jesus, then what was gonna happen would be that he would turn their lives upside down when in in essence, all he really wanted to do is turn their lives right side up. And that's the same for us today. If if we become followers of Jesus, he's going to turn things upside down, but ultimately, really, what's happening is he's turning things right side up. Everything begins to make sense as you follow Jesus. Now, one of the things that I I love here is is not only were they open-minded, they were eager. They were eager for the truth about God. 
It said, for they received the message with great eagerness, with great eagerness. <clears throat> now, Jimmy mentioned this in the Ash Wednesday service, but these people were seekers. They were seeking after the truth about God. And, and most of these people were, were Jews, and so they had grown up probably their whole lives studying the scriptures, talking about them as they rose in the morning, as they went to sleep at night. And, and they knew that the promises were that, that God would eventually come near. That was the promise. It's always been the promise that God was going to send a savior, a rescuer for mankind. And so while they studied and they, they longed to learn more about God, they ultimately longed to experience God in a real and personal way. Again, God promised to come near. Now, you see, many people confuse religion for a relationship with God. Many people confuse religion for a relationship with God. See, religion is all about following some moral code or ceremonial rituals. Religion's all about following some moral code or ceremonial rituals. It's, it's like if you're traveling down 81. What do you notice on both sides of the highway? Guardrails, right? What's the purpose of guardrails? It's to protect us. It's to protect us from veering too far to the right or too far to the left. They keep us safe. They may save our lives even. See, they are needed. They are useful. That's like religion. There, there's a, a good purpose to religion. It can keep us safe. It can protect us. But those guardrails do not produce life, do they? They do not produce life. And religion does not produce life. Do you know what produces life? Relationships. Relationships. Life is found in relationships, not religion. And yet we have lots of different religions. And even in Christianity, in our faith, we see that God has provided some guardrails, right? Think about the Ten Commandments. Aren't they guardrails? They protect us from going too far to the left, too far to the right. They keep us from harm. They may keep us from death. There's a purpose for religion, but they don't produce life. There's no life in the law. The life comes from relationship, and that's what God has been about from the very beginning. That's why Jesus stepped down out of heaven and came to earth. That's why when we study about him and we read like the book of John, the gospel of John, we see that Jesus is referred to as the word. We look to the Bible as the word, but, but Jesus is the word of God made flesh. The word of God made flesh. The word of God who came to dwell among us. We also see that Paul speaks to this as well on a number of occasions in his letters to the churches that he helped start. One is in Colossians. It's, it's to the church of Colossa. And we haven't gotten to that part in Acts. He hasn't established the church there, but he will. And at some point in time, he writes a letter to them. And, and this is what he says. He says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lies in bodily form. What he's saying is, is Jesus is fully God, yet fully man. And so these people in Berea, they were eager. They were eager to receive the truth about God. They were eager to experience the truth about God because God had come near in the person of Jesus Christ. But here's one of the things that I really love and respect about these people. They weren't willing to just take Paul's word for it. No, they, they wanted to study. They wanted to examine to see if this is really true. They wanted to be committed to examining the facts. And so that's what we see happening next. Um, again, look at verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character. So again, they were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness. So they were eager to discover the truth about God, and now they examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. 
Now, I thought this was interesting. If you were here last week or you've been following along, um, you know, online or, or somewhere like that, you may recall that as Paul came to Thessalonica, he went to the synagogue and he began to reason with the people. He began to open up the scriptures and also share about the life of Jesus and see how they aligned and how Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, how often did they meet together to reason? We were told last week that in Thessalonica, he spent three weeks opening up the scriptures and reasoning with them. It said three consecutive Sabbaths. So that would have been three consecutive Saturdays. But notice what's different with these people. How often did they want to sit down and open up the scriptures and listen to the stories about Jesus, to examine and see exactly what the facts were every day. It says that they met every day to see if what Paul said was true. They weren't willing to let another week go by. They were so anxious. They were so eager to know, is this true? Is Jesus the one that we've been looking for all our lives? They were eager. But again, they were serious and they studied. They examined the facts. And you know what they found? You know what the response was to these facts? Well, we see because of their open-mindedness and their eagerness to discover the truth about God and their commitment to examining the facts, verse 12 tells us that as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. The result of being open-minded of being eager to know the truth about God, of being committed to examining the facts, was that they came to faith. They believed. And we see that many people believed in Jesus, became followers of Jesus. Many Jews, many non-Jews or Gentiles or Greeks in this situation, many men, and also many women. And one of the things that we also see next is that they took their faith, their beliefs, and they put them into action immediately. Because guess who showed up next? Those jealous Jewish leaders and probably some of their followers from Thessalonica. Because the word had spread that Paul was now in Berea and he was sharing this message of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And they were not happy because remember how they responded to the message and the messenger? They were hostile to the message. They had already made up their minds. They were jealous of what was happening with, with the followers of Jesus. And so they had incited a mob back in Thessalonica. They had sought to kill Paul and his companions. Well, when that wasn't successful, they now came to Berea with the same intentions. And they began to stir up the crowd and generate a mob. And they wanted to seize Paul and kill him. But the belief of these new followers of Jesus led them to action. And so they came alongside of Paul and they immediately whisked him away, took him down to the coast, put him on a ship, and he set sail for Athens. Faith with action. So we see these Bereans that they're, they're different than the folks in Thessalonica, or at least some of the folks in Thessalonica, because everywhere Paul went on these first two missionary journeys, there were always some people that believed, right? But up to this point, there had always been people that didn't, that were sort of closed-minded, that are hardened in their hearts, that were really jealous of what they were seeing. But these folks were different. And so here, here's my hope um, for us I think there are some of us that this really will apply to, but I, I think we all know some people that are not followers of Jesus Christ. And they probably have some misconceived ideas. They may feel threatened by the message or what it might do or what changes might come if they become followers of Jesus. And the thing that encourages me from this passage is that I really believe 
that if you honestly want to know the truth about God, and specifically Jesus, you will find it. You will find it. If you want to know the truth, you will find it. But I think a lot of people, and a lot of us, at least at some point in our lives maybe, have been intellectually dishonest. I think a lot of times we're intellectually dishonest, and we're not willing to take the time to put in the research, to examine the facts, to know the truth. Because if we want to know the truth, we'll find it. And so I want to share with you just one man's story of his search for truth. And he's a guy that's in the church now. His name's Kevin Myers. And I want you to just maybe open up your minds, open up your hearts, and ask God to reveal to you the truth about him. Here you go. I'm Kevin Myers. I'm 36. I'm from Run-Up, Virginia. Was not a Christian growing up. We went to church every once in a while for Mother's Day, Easter, probably like a lot of people do. But um, I met Kristen at Olive Garden, and uh, she really didn't go to church much when, when we first met. And she started going more and more in her mid-20s. Um, I think it was about that time I actually had told her that I would never believe in God. And that's when we had the discussion that I would let our kids grow up to be Christians, but I would never believe myself. Um, she didn't have much of a reaction because she, she's nice, so she let that go. Um, you know, fast forward another kid a couple years later, and I don't know why I started searching. I don't. Um, I started reading books, and it wasn't Christian books at first. And one day when I was searching on Amazon for the next book I was going to read, Proof of Heaven popped out to me for some reason. I don't even know why it showed up you know, in books I might like. So anyways, I bought that book, and that's where it all started. I read The Shack after that. Um, Kristen and I watched the movie on Netflix, of course, and then I read the book, and of course there's a lot more in the book than there is the movie. From there, I went ahead and read the New Testament, and I'll be honest with you, I was like completely lost. I'm like, what is going on here? It's the same story over and over. I didn't know about the synoptic um, gospels at that point. So, um, but I got super interested in Jesus. And I was like, whoa, this dude's awesome. Um, you know, he's, he turned the world upside down. So then I read Killing Jesus with Bill O'Reilly, and that really brought everything together. Like, so that lays out the synoptic go the Gospels um, all in a row. So that's actually when I think I really started believing. You know, I'm like, I, and I remember telling Kristen, um, she's like, what did you think about that book? And I was like, I think Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and she started crying. <laughs> Yeah, I think you have to have an open mind and you have to realize that the truth is out there. You just have to go and find it. Um, you know, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't read that first book, I'm not sure where my relationship would be. Scott pointed out how big of an impact it's going to have for probably generations to come, you know, I, I, and that never really occurred to me when I started reading this book. So. I've always loved her, definitely, always loved her. But ever since I became a follower of Jesus, I've definitely loved her more. Um, same thing with my kids. Um, you know, now it's really, she's always had my back, but now knowing that Jesus is there for the both of us um, is fantastic, you know. And knowing how much happier she is now due to me becoming a follower just warms my heart. It's, it's awesome. So I, I think it completed us both. It completed me, completed her, and completed our relationship. Knowing how much happened.
happier she is now due to me becoming a follower just warms my heart <laughs> it's awesome so I, I think it completed us both it completed me completed her and completed our relationship tell me how has kevin become a follower it affected you personally so it's made my faith so much stronger because um like I always knew that I was loved by God and but it can be really hard when one person um has a strong walk with God and one doesn't when Willow was first born I actually was attending another church in Roanoke with my friend and I took Willow to get dedicated and I remember standing up there in front of this church and it was a huge church and in front of hundreds of people by myself with my newborn baby and dedicated her there and that was really hard and now I get to do it my entire family is here with me and it's just like it's amazing and I got to watch Willow get baptized with my husband and if you had asked me that that would if you had told me that would happen 10 years ago I would have laughed like never in a million years I really thought that he would find Jesus on his deathbed and I was willing to wait that long because it was worth it to me because I love him um, but I'm lucky that it happened sooner believe with all my heart that um, if, if you really want to know the truth about God, all you have to do is, is seek, ask, or knock. That's what Jesus said. I think that's a great testimony to the truth of that, isn't it? And, and one of the other things that I really um, appreciated about Kevin's testimony there is it, it wasn't like he was really starting out that way, right? But did you know that, that Jesus is seeking you that he's knocking even when you're not knocking revelation 3 20 says this this these are jesus's words as revealed to, to john he said here i am i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door and he's talking about opening the door of our hearts and our lives i'll come in and eat with that person and they with me if you want to know the truth about god and specifically jesus all you have to do is knock ask seek or, or just simply open the door and let him come in and he'll take care of the rest but i'm afraid so many of us and and i know we all have friends and and i know a lot of us have have family members that we long to see come to know jesus and experience the true life that comes from a relationship with him not just some dead religious experience And they just won't. And they'll, they'll have excuses, right? But, but I believe there's a lot of easy unbeliefism, as I would refer to it. And I think there's also a lot of easy beliefism. I think there are not many people like Kevin who take the time to really search for the answers, who examine the facts. Because if you do, you'll find them if you're open-minded if you have an eagerness to know the truth about god if you're committed to examining the facts you will find them have you done that and the other thing i love about their story do you notice the impact it has did you notice the impact it had on his marriage and it's continuing to have on his marriage do you notice the impact it's having on his family. I mean, if you were here, they both got baptized. I baptized Kevin first and then had him stay in the water and then his daughter Willow came down and together we baptized Willow. That's sweet. Their lives will be forever different. I, I 
firmly believe generations to come will be forever different because he sought and he found. He knocked and the door was open. He asked and he received the answers. If you want to know the truth about God, all you have to do is look. Are you looking? Are you looking? Are you studying? Are you prepared to be used by God to maybe open a door for somebody else? Maybe today's the day that, that God's been knocking. Maybe you don't even know why you're here. And, and God just set a, a certain course of events in motion so that you would be here or you'd be watching online. You would li listen to this message because he wants you to come into a relationship with him. If, if that's the case, I'm, I'm telling you, he's about to turn your world upside down. But I think what you're going to find out is he's really turning it right side up and everything's going to begin to make more sense as you follow him. Consider receiving Jesus today and following after him. The results, the blessings can last not just for one generation, but for generations to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that this isn't